Hi, and welcome back to Energy Explained, our family YouTube channel. I have with me my father, as we usually do. And on this channel, what we do is we take energy news or other science or technology news from the headlines, and we try to break it down in an easy-to-understand way and have a conversation about it. It's something we've always done in our family, and so we thought, let's just record it and see what happens. We're having such a great time doing it that we have another episode here. Um... I have with me my father, Vikram Rao. He comes to us as the former CTO of Halliburton. He has a PhD in engineering. He speaks to us with authority and all things energy. And today we're going to be talking about this recent announcement in the news from Shell. And they came out and said, Shell said oil production for them peaked in 2019 and they expect annual declines of 1% to 2% for the foreseeable future. This is, quote unquote, they've said we've reached peak oil. And so let's let's just jump right into it. You've probably heard, if you're listening, the concept of peak oil. But dad, what is peak oil? What's that just what's that initial concept? Right. So peak oil, actually the ironic thing is that peak oil was uh, invented, the term is invented by King Hubbard, who was a shell geologist uh, back in the 1960s. Okay. Uh, so he came up with the concept of peak oil and it was in always intended to be uh, a peak in production, yeah. but it was premised on the fact that, oh, well, see, what he saw is the fact that it just wasn't available and that's right. why you couldn't produce more. Right. So it is premised on the reserves would be dropping off. And that uh, was in the 90s. We, 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 you, I remember hearing, oh, it's always in the news, what's our current level of reserves? We have 20 more years. And of course, that's at constant prices, which wouldn't have happened. But that was like a huge thing. And we, I haven't heard that in a while. No, that's right. In fact, that 20 is an interesting number. Uh, when I did my undergraduate in India in, in, in 65, they were saying 20. And then in 1990, they were still saying, saying 20. 20. It seems like yeah. <laughs> 20 more years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we kept finding it. We just kept finding the stuff. We kept finding, we kept finding it. Uh, so that's what Hubbard was talking about was uh, peak production, but based upon not being able to find enough. Okay. Right, right. What Shell is talking about is different. What Shell is saying, although they're using the same terminology, oddly, because their guy invented it, is a different point. They're saying they will peak, have mm. peaked at 2019 by choice. Okay. So they're not going to be saying that... Uh, it's not available. They're saying they are choosing not to. So, for example, they have chosen not to go after some of the uh, uh, newer finds and so forth because, uh, so that's their strategic decision. But note that they're saying oil, they're not saying gas. Yeah, and and and, and you had kind of alerted to me that as, as always pay attention to that. But, you know, they're one of the biggest oil and gas producers in the world. So they're certainly not, while... To your point, in the past, this was a strictly supply-based assessment. Supply will dwindle, prices will go up, oil will be priced out of methods of production due to the scarcity effect. And that's not what's happening here because as we've talked about, you and others project oil prices to maintain 40 to $70 per barrel, and it's not a priced out of the market effect. It's a supplanted by different sources, almost priced from the other side. There's other better ways to do this. That's different. But Shell saying their production is peaked, while it's not all oil production is peaked, others are talking about that that could be the case. What's your take? Has Will we look at 2019? Is that is that the year of peak oil? Um, or is it that you think it will be a similar to 2019 or even higher in 2021? Yeah, no. It, it, oil is not peaked except by choice. Mm. Herbert's idea of peak oil was that it, it was inevitable because you just couldn't find more. Right. Uh, uh, shale oil changed all of that. Okay. Uh, there, there's plenty of it and everyone knows it. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, and Shell took significant positions in shale oil. So they know it, it, this is a by choice. So each company is deciding what, so BP announced that by 2030, they were, their oil production would drop by 40%, four zero. What Shell is talking about is much less dramatic. They're talking one to 2% each year. Right. Although, uh, if we end 21 by 30, it could be, you know. Uh, if it's, if it's on the that. higher side and, and you yes, compound the interest, that's 25% down, it's not too different. 
you got it. So, so two, two of the, what they call super majors yeah. have plunked yeah. down and said they will simply produce less. And you say this is implications you, to price. But yeah. you say it's by choice, but you know, they're in a market and they're, it, is it by choice? Okay. Yes. But are they responding to projected demand conditions? I'd also say yes. So while it's their choice, it's not the the old school peak oil story, which is simply a scarcity story. This is very much a replacement of other forms of energy story, which is a good thing, <laughs> which is a good thing overall for society. But it's it's not like they're in the, they just like went all tree hugger, right? And of course we love tree huggers too, but it, that's not what's going on here. It's not like they're making some moral choice. They're projecting demand and their thing to be a modern energy company, oil will be a declining uh, 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 source um, of Absolutely. energy. Absolutely. That's what they're saying. And, and, and actually, in the case of Shell, uh, what they didn't say or said very little is about gas. And we'll let's go into that because they said what they would stop doing less of. And they were kind of silent on the mm -hmm. gas point. And then later in the announcement, um, there are clues, which we will go into, okay? The other thing you should know, that in my opinion, uh, Shell is the best super major in terms of the ability to predict the future. Uh, now, why do you say that? Best... What, what, what do you, what base, what, what's the form of the basis of that assessment? I have, I have known all the super majors and, and casting nothing on anybody. Uh, Shell does the best m scenario modeling. Okay. Okay. That's a core yeah. strength of theirs. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That's a core strength. Uh, so I would take shell scenario models over some of the others, uh, taking nothing away from the others. This is just a competency of theirs. Yeah. So, so when shell is suggesting a certain direction, uh, you might want to place a few bets on that. So, so that's, yeah. It's turning heads. It's turning heads. But this gas piece, I'm intrigued. Um, it's omitted. We, we have discussed... Uh, on this channel, gas as a fuel source that is transitional in nature to transition to green energy because of its use in electric electricity production and because of its use in, in particular to scale up electricity production rather quickly for peak load servicing. So gas is not in here. Are they making strategic investments in gas as much as green energy? Is it really gas? Is it also green energy? How are they looking at themselves as an energy company if their main product is having facing declining demand? Okay. <laughs> First of all, when you say main product, uh, when companies face the situation where their core product is under threat, um, they kind of change the definition of what the core is. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. It's not oil. It was energy all along. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the energy, and in the case of Shell, gas. Okay, they didn't speak about gas per se, but the proxy for what they said is in there, LNG, liquefied natural gas, mm -hmm. okay? Shell is the leader in LNG among the whole cohorts, yeah. okay? So that's point one. I'm going to read to you, they say, they use the word extending leadership in LNG. That is code for, that's where we're going to put the expansion in. I see. Okay. I see. Okay. I see. And then you read a little further into their into their uh, into their announcement, and they say they will add seven million metric tons annually by the middle of the next decade. Annually, okay, seven million metric tons. Seven million metric tons will add up to be about a medium-sized LNG facility. Okay. So basically, they're adding a medium-sized LNG facility every year. Okay. 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 I, and these things pay off in 25 years. Yeah, those right. are 20, 30 year capital life cycle projects, okay. right? So, so we're talking big bets, okay? Uh, and we're talking big bets in LNG. So why, you might ask, yeah. they're doing that. That's no, see, I was gonna ask as the host, yeah. but then you asked yourself, so it's, it's working out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so what? what? So um, here's, here's the thing. Gas is much cleaner than oil. And you mentioned earlier that gas, many people consider natural gas to be the bridge to renewables. Yeah. Uh, so that's part of it. I think a lot of it is that renewables need a load leveler. 
because mm-hmm. renewables are right. up and down. We've discussed this before yeah. in previous On the power uh, grid, they, they, need, they need something to fill in the peaks, the troughs, and they need some way to deal yep. with the peaks, which we talked about with the hydrogen economy. But yeah, we, we talked about natural gas there for sure. Yep. And today, the best way to do that is natural gas. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow, it'll be hydrogen. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? Yeah. Uh, but today, it's natural gas. Uh, and take, for example, India, okay? India has doubled down on wind and solar, particularly solar, all right? And they're going to have their very aggressive growth of the renewables. And India doesn't have a lot of natural gas. So, so what gives? What gives is a bunch of LNG imports. And now That's the L gives. is important here. So can you explain to us the L and LNG? Because we think of natural gas as gas, but the L obviously liqu- liquefied. Talk us through the technology advancements there, um, because it's not just a gas bet Shell's making. It's a liquefied natural gas bet they're making, which is interesting to me. Exactly. So if you want to transport natural gas over great distances, particularly over the ocean, mm-hmm. there's only two ways to do that. One is as a hydrate, and we won't go into it. It's a very esoteric point. Uh, but the other is by, as a liquid. And mm-hmm. as a liquid, it is about 600 times the density of free gas. Okay. So, so liquefied natural gas is the way to transport oil, sorry, natural gas across oceans. Got it. And they're the best at it. So, so that is what's that's what that is why liquefied natural gas, short form LNG, is critical for gas importing nations that can't be served with pipelines. China can be served with a pipeline from uh, Russia. Uh, Europe can be served with pipelines from Russia also, uh, but India can't be served by pipelines easily. How do you see Europeans' dependence on Russian pipelines interacting with new LNG technology such that they could get their natural gas through other providers if political tensions uh, flared up? Do you see that as as also part of maybe Shell's thinking here is that you can't just be dependent on the Russian nation state right now with what's going on there? Yeah, I don't think Shell plays politics that much. It is more that if you have LNG, LNG is usually the marginal cubic foot of gas. Mm -hmm. So it sets the price. So this is why Russia is so keen to have the Northern Nord line, okay, the Northern gas line, because uh, they they can price it pegged on LNG pricing, which they can- Interesting. Interesting. And for those people listening, if you remember from your high school or college economics class, you were building that supply curve and you were saying, what sets the price? It's where supply meets demand. And what my father just said is, the, the supply curve is upward sloping at higher at levels of supply. You need higher prices to support that. The marginal supply is the supply that lets you meet demand. And it's what sets the price for the market. So knowing that LNG is the marginal uh, setting, the marginal uh, price that's saying um, it's going to be driving, as you said, uh, the world's prices. So Shell's making a bet in, in, in some sense, they're betting on LNG but really they're betting on gas generally. Is that, is that a fair way to say it? That's correct. That's correct. So gas is already cleaner. And gas has another very interesting angle to it in which Shell is also the leader. And that is called uh, GTL, gas to liquids. Hmm. So you can make uh, diesel with natural gas that's much cleaner uh, because it doesn't have almost any aromatic compounds. So when you burn it, uh, you get much less pollution and you get much less particulate matter also uh, because they're smaller molecules, etc. So it really is an interesting situation where GTL, which Shell is also a leader, starts from natural gas. Yeah. So natural gas for them, yeah. it's a good call yeah. by them because yeah. it will yeah, it I can be used see that. as a... Yeah. But you're saying it's a good call from a fundamentals perspective of demand characteristics. It's a good call from emerging markets um, investing in green energy, thus increasing their need for natural gas, especially places that don't have it in the ground. But you're saying it's also a good call to extend their technical lead in transport and liquefaction of the stuff, which plays to what their announcement was at extending their lead. And so you sort of see it from the business logic, but also um, the 
the sort of geopolitical demand landscape and and, and and that 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 perspective as well. Now let me ask you this. Now you were an energy executive and you're seeing we're, um, energy companies responding to projected changes in demand patterns. So um, if you were you know in those boardrooms, how do you think of structuring your business to respond to changing energy demand? Now we've seen Shell make this announcement. You want to transition from an oil and gas company to an energy company. What do you do besides natural gas? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so what some of them have done is they've invested in solar and wind. Okay. Not Shell. Okay. I might Interesting. Have been, Interesting. Might have might have dribbled around in it. Right. But no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and why? Because they have no competence in that space. Okay. Uh, they have no edge. So what they they are they are being truly clever on this. They are going for those things which are companion to renewables rather than renewables. For example, high, renewables, you, you touched on it earlier. Uh, because the intermittency, uh, it has to be supplied some other way, the, the peaking. Uh, and right now it's natural gas, but in the future it could be hydrogen. In fact, it's very likely to be hydrogen. Where if we remember, we discussed that when it's an oversupply time, those few hours there's an oversupply, right. uh, we just electrolyze water to make hydrogen. Well, guess who knows a lot about hydrogen? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so what I would say that what Shell will do, they won't go into the production of renewables. They will go into the distribution. The distribution of hydrogen, ammonia, the whole hydrogen economy, they the want to fill economy. a similar role where they are the experts in transportation, liquefaction, delivery of uh, effectively fuel sources, whether it be um, natural gas or hydrogen. You got it. And so, so, the, so they're saying, yes, it's changing, but we will enter the part of that value chain that fits with our core competencies. I mean, it's, it's bloody smart. It's you smart. Know, right? And you say it's part of their core competencies, scenario modeling. Let me throw, we, when, when we do scenario modeling, we think of the where's the, where's the risk? Where's the risk sitting? Now, let me throw a risk at you here of this plan. The risk I see is that, we, as we know, peak oil, oil depends on prices. And this was the discussion all along. So, if OPEC breaks down and oil drops to $15 a barrel, which is not unprecedented for one historically, and it's certainly not outside the realm of possibility, what happens? Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's, uh, predicting oil prices is dicey at best. But back in 2016, when I wrote one of my books, I predicted with, with confidence that for five years, it would be between the numbers you mentioned earlier, yeah. 45 to 70. Okay. Yeah. I could predict out five years very confidently. Yeah. And my and had my reasons, including that shale oil was so abundant that whenever uh, the, there was an uptick in price, uh, th these guys would kick in because they were mostly small independent producers. Uh, and once they kicked in enough, the price would let, dampen down. Come back down. Okay? Makes so, sense. Yeah. Your classic economic stuff. Okay. Yeah. So, the supply and demand uh, would ensure that it'll stay in a pretty tight range. All right. Now, that's changed. Mm. Okay. So what has changed now is a couple of things. First of all, a bunch of those independent producers went bankrupt and or and then sold them their properties to the majors, we call them. Mm -hmm. All right. So now folks with longer views and mm. strategies mm. are owning these properties not folks who are simply reacting to price i see okay so 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 that's one thing that's changed okay the other thing that's changed is that the demand is going to be dropping because of electric vehicles and because of the sentiments okay yeah. of the of the shareholders so <clears throat> so now i would say prices are going to firm up Okay. In what range? Okay. What's your prediction now? Yeah. So now my prediction, okay. Yeah. And I'm not an economist, so take it with some. Yeah, you know more than I do though. What's your prediction? You were right last time. Let's do it again. Let's roll it. Let's roll for it. <laughs> yes, I was right last time. Maybe I should just stop when I'm ahead. I was no, right no, you can't. Now you're right. Now you now more people want to hear it. Yeah, I would say that unless OPEC goes crazy, 
but OPEC doesn't have as much power as it used to. No, and we know the uh, Saudi government needs certain prices to break even, and those prices are not at 20. And so it's sort of a death They're sentence. definitely not, yeah. because the social costs are high. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I would up my, my floor up from 45 to closer to 50 to 55, and up my ceiling from 70 to, I would say, 85. Okay. Okay. So, th so this is what. So, I would say it's closer to fifty to eighty-five that it'll be floating, uh, and the degree to which it uh, it does that will be will be come somewhat. See, look at this. Take Shell and BP, uh, actually announcing they'll produce less. What, right. what does that do? Is that supply on? Okay. Right. Uh, if others follow and shareholders are demanding it, yes, shareholders yes. <laughs> applauded these moves. Yes. So. The, other public companies are going to follow suit. So supply make a constraint. That 85 I'm mentioning may even get tested yeah. a little bit higher. Yeah. Okay. So in general, contrary to what I felt in 2016, I feel things are going to get firmed. Yeah. I think that the dampener of shale oil is still there. Yeah. But I but it is there in the hands of folks who are more strategic, who are not more reactive. And we've so, seen and we've seen how these strategies are playing out with these announcements, commitments to lower supply and commitments to shareholders diversify their holdings. Um, and that's playing out with uh, a story they can more control around price. And as we've sort of alluded to, we can discuss in other topics, OPEC's hands are a little tied in what they can strategically do, given their essentially need to balance a budget in their for their government expenditure in, in big places like Saudi Arabia. So it's, it sounds like a story is lining up around. This is about peak oil in terms of uh uh, production. That being said, not for the reason it was first written out in the 60s, not for the reason we heard about in the 90s, but for a brand new reason that's fresh, which is super interesting. We are basically at time. So is there anything we missed or are you feeling good about this one? We got to follow up in a few topics. Yep. No, I'm good. All right. Well, we are going to follow up on this topic with um, uh, how this impacts renewables, um, as well as a more detailed look at oil prices in future episodes. If you want to catch those future episodes, we always remind you to subscribe or check out one of the old episodes because we're doing this every week, a father and son team. And we really appreciate all the support we've gotten from people and want to reach out to more people as well. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.